welcome everybody. Thank you so much for joining us for our inaugural, um, we call it Tap to New York, or so our kind of innovation series in New York City at General Assembly. And uh, we're really excited to have a stellar panel here. I'll let them all introduce themselves. Uh, my name is Arkady Friedman. I'm the evangelist here in uh, New York for Clever Tap. Um, just in case you, you haven't uh, heard about CleverTap, we're a next generation mobile analytics company. We're focused on app developers and marketers. Um, and not only do we offer analytics and mobile analytics that you can plug in really easily, but we also help you personalize and engage, retain uh, your users uh, through really kind of spectacular technology. Um, and the focus of this panel is, is called the Art and Science of personalizing your mobile app, and we hope that we get a chance to, to talk about you know every aspect of it. Uh, feel free to ask questions. I think it should be engaging and interactive. And this is also being live streamed on YouTube right now. Um, and I'll send out the link to everybody so you can you know watch it after, tell your friends about it, tweet about it. Uh, thank you again for joining us, and I'll hand it over to Malcolm. Thanks, Arkady. Um, just by way of introduction, my name is Malcolm Freeberg. I'm the CMO of CleverTap. As our probably explained, we're a mobile analytics and engagement company. And it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, just a bit about me. My background is 20 years in B2B marketing. I kind of cut my teeth in the marketing automation world. And kind of what I've noticed, what's interesting about the mobile world is it's kind of uh, email marketing 2.0, sort of where it was 10 years ago, where marketers don't know what to do, developers don't know what to do, so it's kind of the wild, wild west. So it's exciting to be here. I'm excited to hear from our panelists, and again, thanks for coming. So why don't we just go down the line, Chuck, why don't you start and introduce yourself, tell us a bit about yourself. Uh, sure, I am uh, Chuck Wei, I'm the CEO of Jodi uh, We are a uh, UX and uh, software development company. Uh, based uh, over here in Soho, as well as uh, offices in Vietnam and Singapore. Uh, we work with uh, startups and brands, and uh, some of our startup clients have uh, gone on to raise over 100 million dollars in funding. Hi, I'm Cesar Aguilar. I'm the director of Android and QA at Fuzz Productions. We're a uh, uh, digital agency uh, for, um, from UX strategy. Sorry, I think your mic is off. <laughs> um, full service uh, resiliency for um, strategy, UX, design, uh, development, and QA. Um, and yeah, that's the rules. Uh, cool. uh, my name is uh, Winston. I founder of a new uh, startup consultant firm called Boy Bread, um, formerly director of Digital Tasty. Um, essentially what we do at Boy Bread is basically everything that uh, we can to take an idea from zero to 100. So UX, UI strategy, uh, digital strategy, design, um, and everything up to um, four or five day design sprints. Um, everything that the uh, startup founder or uh, either company found would be to, to launch a digital product. Hey guys, I'm um, Michael Kopchev from Reactor in North America. Uh, Reactor is a, a creative technology house. We uh, started off from Helsinki, so that's where our headquarters is. Uh, branch out to New York about a year ago. Uh, we do kind of high-end custom software for our clients that include HBO and NASDAQ and major airlines, and then we're really focused on creating products for our clients that, you know, otherwise couldn't uh, try to help with really kind of high-end products. Great, thanks guys. So, uh, I want to kind of structure the conversation in three parts. Kind of the conceiving of your mobile app, and what goes into that part of the process, the actual building of the app, and maybe some of the technical aspects, SDKs, and things of that sort. And then, you know, the growing, you getting your first thousand or ten thousand or a million customers, as it were. Um, before we do that, uh, one other thing, if you have questions, just put your hand up. 
to me, it's fine if we can take questions in the middle, it kind of makes it a little bit more engaging. Um, but before we go to uh, sort of the first question that I have, I just want to have each of you maybe talk a bit about what personalization means to each of you. When we talk about this idea of personalizing it, you know, again, I haven't come from the email market world, I know exactly what that means. It means the email that I send to Winston is different from the email that I send to Michael, and I have data which tells me how to customize the information. So maybe each of you could, uh, come from your own perspective in the app world, explain what personalization means to you. I can start. Uh, for me, I think it's not just about you know, uh, you know what, uh, what who you are, uh, you know what you what what actions have you done, but also a combination of uh, location, time, uh, uh, all that factor that come into play. Uh, to uh, uh, if you're able to pretty much leverage on all that, uh, then uh, be able to really uh, serve a a notification or call to action that's truly uh, that gives you a much better uh, uh, conversion. Um, yeah, kind of uh, going off what Chuck said a little bit there. Um, at this point in age, where all our phones have all these sensors, like everything should be more contextual. Not just it's not just about you know the actions you take. It's about you know uh, I'm here. I want uh, you know I just opened up. An app for say, um, say you're at a Shake Shack or something, uh, and it's already like, oh, last time you ordered this, just that's a, like that right there is a, you know, streamlining the process right there. That's personalization for me. Uh, from a user perspective, uh, personalization is kind of it's, it's basically the difference between lean back and lean forward. Um, you know, it's basically the lean back effect where that knows enough about me that I don't have to tell tell it more than it actually needs to know. So, um, same with what Susan was saying, you know, if, if I'm at a location, if I'm, you know, if I have a history, um, putting those things together to to the point where when I open the app, uh, everything is already kind of on to the line. Um, and it's very much uh, personalization to me is like very much like. Me not losing a finger um, when I need the app to do what it needs to do. Yeah, I think the guys already pretty much said most of the things that's been said. But yeah, personalization, especially on mobile, in my opinion, is is the default right now. I mean, every single mobile app we build has to be personalized. If you think about even like Facebook apps, they're all very much customized to your. Kind of needs and, and abilities so that should be the default and if you want to push things further if you want to differentiate yourself you really have to figure out different ways to actually find find those people and, and kind of make them click in a way okay that's a great foundation so which we're going to put this first question at you okay. um, so you're planning an app. Somebody, a client comes to you and says, hey, I've got this idea, I want to build an app. Um, how do you help them think about that? And do you ever say, well, you shouldn't be building an app. You need to you know, go to school. I do it all the time. Uh, and you still make a living? <laughs> <laughs> there. Um, but, well, the biggest thing I, I would say is, um, so at Break Break, we, the first step is to actually create a user profile. So we were like, who actually uses your app? You know, who are the people and we create three, four, five profiles. Um, and we encourage our founders to actually not think of them or their friends um, because it's always uh, kind of the downfall uh, for any app developer. It's like, oh, me and my friends do this. It's like, well, that's great, but there's billions of people in this world. Um, so it's kind of like the lesson number one. And then we kind of, from there, just look at the different scenarios. Uh, that person A will be here in uh, Flatiron, and they want to do X, Y, and Z. How's your app going to allow them to do that? Uh, person B is going to be in Upper West Side doing X, Y, and Z. How's your app going to allow them to do that? And to really kind of step through exactly, um, you know, take the idea of, of what, you know, it's like, oh, this is a really cool idea. It's like, well, well, let's break it down. What's step one? What's step two? What's, what's step three? What's step four? Uh, it really kind of helped the founder kind of really think out and exactly what their product wants to do. 
Cool. Well, Michael, I'm curious. You work with big brands that obviously have a lot of money and unlimited resources. So, in a number of cases. So, how does the process that you go through with the client compare to the you know, Winston's kind of goal or working with an entrepreneur and picking through some of the basics? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I think our approach, even though we work with big companies, our approach is very agile and lean. So, we try to kind of force the client to work in a very kind of startup mode, if you will. Um, so we'll try to actually get them to, uh, you know, do fast development cycles. And even in the beginning, we'll try to incorporate analytics and, and stuff like that. So it kind of differs in a way that big corporations tend to have more structured and, and big hierarchies and bureaucracies. And we kind of want to challenge that and get like shit done fast, if you will. And and I think that's that's kind of something we need to aim for, and that requires a lot of work. Uh, but most of our clients are really kind of willing to do that as well, because nowadays you can't really spend six months on building, like planning something, and then think, okay, maybe we'll build this. You really have to kind of try to do something and try it out, do quick runs, see how it works, put in analytics, do A-B testing. So the, all the things that I think you guys are probably doing as well, we're trying to make the big corporations do as well. Uh, um, so Fuzz, um, I've been there for a while, so I've seen us work with a lot of small startups all the way to the more bigger corporations now as we've Kind of involved and consistently we even no matter you know what size you're at we try and make all our clients go through the same kind of process of of like let's digest let's figure out what exactly you're trying what your problem is uh, how you're trying to address it and from there kind of see the you know competitive landscape a little bit get that all in and then figure out okay so who are the users that you're actually going to be able to get into your product and you know, start building up from personas, and uh, you know, building up a product from there. Oh, dude, you said my favorite word. I was just about to ask that persona. Um, just by show of hands, anybody know that word persona? Do you use that word? Good word to know. Target market persona. Uh, in my experience, that's where a lot of designers, developers, people fall down is that they don't take the time to really build that out. Um, Joe, do you want to talk about kind of how your clients think about that or how you counsel people to think about that aspect of the journey? Yeah, uh, I think a lot of times people take this for granted or it's, you know, it's, um, so we, we, we think about the personas who are, who are all the different users of the app and then we, what we do is we de uh, develop user journeys. So how, how does a different persona uh, kind, of, uh, kind of users kind of journey to the application? Uh, and that, that is pretty much the, the, the foundation of how we start our user experience uh, you know, um, exercise. Uh, and from there, uh, you know, uh, kind of derive uh, uh, wireframes um, and all that uh, before we uh, move into kind of a development mode. So, bring this back to the personalization theme. How do you, any of you, think about? You've got different user groups and you take them through you know wireframes and a kind of user customer journey um, do you then think about how you can customize or personalize that journey in the context of delivering uh, an app yeah so maybe i can yeah so recently we did uh, a mobile app for uh, finair which is one of the biggest european airlines and uh, so basically the the whole point, obviously, the journey, a customer journey, they're obviously taking an actual journey as well. But it kind of has to be built in, in a way. So what we've done is, is stay, straight when you buy the tickets, it, it'll be in the app. You can buy the tickets from the app and, and, and kind of have to incorporate that. So in the beginning, we started off quite, quite thin, that it's more of an accessory in a way. Uh, and once you go to the uh, airport and you can buy stuff for it. But what we did, we kind of bridged the gap between the mobile and the actual in-flight entertainment system in the plane. So you can actually kind of like order drinks beforehand from the app. And and that kind of creates this unified experience. And, and obviously, then you'll have to 
kind of bring personalization into that like quite strongly that it has to be there so the person has to feel okay this is my app this is where all my journey is everything is here so it's obviously i think it depends on the case but especially in this case it's quite you have to think of it as a kind of a as a whole not just as a small mobile app so you guys get sophisticated. I like the idea of bringing it into the journey. It's obviously unique for an airline, but um, are you able to say, hey, Malcolm's drinking a, a diet soda uh, last time, so let's ping him and ask him before he gets on his flight if he wants to order another diet soda. Like, do you use the data to personalize the experience? Uh, not yet, but I can what we're planning to do next. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, obviously that's really, it's a, it's kind of a big issue because obviously mobile usage is growing like so much. I think mobile platform in that sense is going to be a much bigger part of the whole kind of customer journey and experience, whether it's an airline or, uh, you know, just an e-commerce app. Cool. Uh, to kind of add to like, customer journey, uh, the personas, like a lot of what personalization is, is your 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 uh, thing to like a scientific level, like it's your hypothesis. Like these are the things that you're, you know, you guess your customers want. This is this is your first stab at like so that is to me like you have to have that at the very beginning. Otherwise you don't really know what you're trying to target or build. Um, and then you that's where your data comes in later. Where you can verify and you can test your hypothesis uh, and adjust uh, and continue evolving your product over time. I think a lot of this uh, our personalization front is still pretty much I feel is at an infancy stage. Uh, whereas uh, you know if, if uh, not done right, uh, for example with the app example, uh, if I order that for the first time, uh, I don't want to be every time I get on the flight it assumes that I, I that I cook and that I get you know pretty much targeted everywhere everything I do. Uh, I think on the web right now, it's, uh, I think that's kind of a, a, a big problem uh, where if you see a certain website now, every website you go to, if they, you know, the, the advertising follows you everywhere, uh, where it becomes annoying and, uh, you know, uh, uh, so uh, I feel like uh, the data, the equal point, uh, it's probably a lot more uh, multidimensional uh, instead of just one, one data point, a collection of few data points to determine uh, you know, what the user actually intends are uh, and be uh, more smart, intelligent, more targeting. With Steve, you and I were chatting before, and you talked about the fact that you come from a more of a web background than a mobile background. Um, do you encounter clients that are mobile first or mobile only? And, and kind of how does your web background experience play into helping them think through that question? Well, I'm, I'm very much like a back a backing guy, so it's always interesting to me. Um, it's the same data; it's just for the very different package. Um, so essentially it's just a lot of clients come to us and they have very big ideas. And the thing about mobile is it's you don't have a lot of real estate there. So we have to really sit down with clients and iterate what that idea is and how we can scale that scale that idea down. So you basically crush dreams. <laughs> And I tell them that the app is like. And your budget you know, is twice as big. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I'm, I'm killing you, Um So yeah, so um, yeah, no. So I mean, it's essentially taking you know a lot of uh, corporate clients are very much still focused on their desktop properties. So uh, when they come to us, you know, they, they kind of want to bring this desktop experience. Uh, but with mobile, uh, it's basically taking maybe the key four or five six elements. I let this have experience, experience and you kind of bring it in. Um, so that's kind of what we look for. So we look at the data links data, uh, we look at you know what's popular, what's, what 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 aspects of the app that we can really um, you know I guess refocus um, and take that and use that as the basis of a mobile design. Cool. All right. So that, that's kind of phase one, right? We we plan our app, we build personas, we thought about use cases, we build a customer journey. So now we're going to actually start to build the app, um, it, either through brand or through type. Uh, for each of you, what are the core SDKs that go into all your apps? 
And remember, I have props to use 20 bucks for every time you mention the letter gap simulation. So the ones we use in almost every app tend to be Google Analytics, Localytics, uh, usually one or, one or the other, but uh, those are the two most common we see. Uh, Urban Airship for push, um, and uh, Crashlytics, because you have to keep up with your performance as well. Um, those would probably be the most the four most common. Uh, and then from there, uh, clients and uh, you know what your product is trying to do, uh, you just have to figure out which SDKs match what your needs are. Uh, but, oh, but, well, just to repeat, Google Analytics uh, is probably the number one. Uh, Fact Analytics is definitely the number two. Um, and, you know, I just had to took my tongue. Um, uh, there's another, there's a uh, server side Analytics that we use um, that I will get back to. Uh, but yeah, Google Analytics, Fact Analytics, Google Analytics we, we use really to kind of track uh, where in the app. Uh, um, you know, essentially the trigger path of the app. So we can track where within the app, um, you know, users are leaving the app or whether they're enjoying the app and um, things like that. Um, and then we also use a uh, app developer portal to really kind of see where the demand is coming from. Um, and that's kind of a, a data point that we use to kind of see if we need to do any type of localization uh, or things like that. So. Yeah, well, um, Reactor is a kind of a different type of company. We're, we're a flat hierarchy company, so all our teams work autonomously. So we don't have uh, kind of every team picks their own tech. Uh, so there's no kind of, we, I mean, everybody shares knowledge, obviously, but we don't have, I mean, some clients want to use Google Analytics, some want to use Adobe for st statistics. So it really depends on the case. And you know, obviously if you're writing code on an airplane, it's gonna be very different if we do, you know, web front end. But I mean what's really popular in our company right now is is obviously React Native is changing stuff on the mobile scene. Um, if we like React on you know on the web and, and, and you know I would say those are probably pretty popular in the front end. And Swift probably, yeah. Uh, New Relic is well, so yeah. yeah. New Relic. Yeah, we were seeing a surge in demand for React. Uh, yeah. It just came out middle of the year. And uh, we, we see React you know, being kind of growing, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, growing popularity going into next year. Yeah, and I mean, React is changing kind of how you write mobile apps. And I mean, it, it has changed uh, the web scene quite strongly in the last year or so, and I kind of believe that React Native is going to at least some level do the same, but remains to be seen. What about the notion of kind of integrating data sources? So what I saw in the email world in the last 36 months was disparate data sources being a problem, in this case for marketers, and wanting to integrate them into one system to have the 360 view of the customer. Um, any ideas or thoughts on, do you see that happening in, in mobile? Are they using their push notification system and it's kind of a default customer database? Are they using some other third party systems? How do you help customers really get a, a full view of what's going on? Um, I, I think we work with a lot of uh, customer clients that are essentially uh, multi uh, platform, so for web and for mobile. Uh, but a lot of solutions uh, we see in the market now, it's either very uh, mobile focus or very web focus. Uh, which, uh, you know, if the customer wants to kind of capture, so the same user, you know, uh, across both platforms, uh, we don't see enough good uh, solutions out there that provide at the moment. But uh, I think that's definitely a, a demand for that market. I think the thing I see the most is, uh, at least for the more corporate uh, clients, is they have all this legacy data they have, but they don't have it in any, any system that, uh, like any, like if they want to use Urban Nurture, for example, they don't have the right, they, all I have is the new data. So that, um, usually for those kind of situations, it's kind of best to kind of make more of a custom solution um, to, so you can leverage your old data. But um, that's usually where I see 
uh, is where it is. Yeah, I mean, for, for us, it's, it, we, we, we kind of, uh, we were talking about this earlier, uh, there, there's just kind of different silos. Um, you know, desktop uh, for a lot of media clients, it's very, very, very easy to track uh, user iterations, uh, whereas on mobile, um, it is not as easy. And I think uh, a lot of clients that I work with uh, don't want to really get into the data issues. Um, some of the, the sensitive sensitivities about, about sharing. Uh, so we pull a lot of aggregate data uh, to really kind of create uh, different models uh, about really going into super specific. Uh, you know, we pull on customer data uh, projects that we work with, um, and that's just because mobile is is still trying to find its footing. Uh, and then there's a lot more data that you can pull from mobile. Uh, especially when it comes to location data, things like that, as opposed to desktop. Um, kind of, well, he was saying, um, other thing I see is um, with web, um, people are kind of more used to, like the, the analytics tools are out there, which allow you to kind of on the fly add new events without really having to uh, worry about the submission process and all that. Like with mobile, you know, because of the delays, uh, you have to be a little more careful, a little more, uh, put a little more thought into what are the core analytics you want, uh, so that you're not having to be reactive uh, when you're trying to catch up. Yeah, basically with us, it's mainly we, our client base is so, they're so different, so we very often build something custom if it's needed. Any gotchas for first time developers out there? Like, don't put this, or do put that, or don't worry about the size of your SDK, or it's fine if you have five SDKs, all of which are sort of similar, but don't necessarily do exactly the same thing. Um, and maybe as a second part, what's your willingness to try new things? Do you feel like it's important to stay with the tried and true, or are you open to trying new platforms as they become available? Okay, I can start. <laughs> I was saying, yeah, I've, I've got a lot of <laughs> a lot of stuff related to that. But um, I think the biggest advice would be to, you know, you know, build stuff as fast as you can and try it out. I mean, with the mobile, it's with the web, it's easy to kind of iterate and you can deploy like five times a day if you want. Uh, with the mobile, it's kind of a bit slower. You have to submit and wait and updates are slow but still like start off with a very small subset of features that you know, you know assume and validate those features and then just try it out and rebuild reiterate pivot if you can um a lot of people who i've known who started doing mobile stuff they might start to overthink it in the beginning maybe over plan it even i'd rather you know have some people doing some concept design with a developer and just figure out and, and just try to validate with different methods on, on what you're actually building and just publish as early as possible. Uh, I guess for, for us, it's, it's kind of along the same lines, um, especially if, if you're a, a new developer and founder, um, you know, just to, to do as much as you can um, and, and play around with as much as you can. Um, I try to encourage people to do uh, what's called personal hackathon. So every weekend, just like think of an idea and pack something together and then you know, just deploy it and see what happens and talk to your friends. Um, as you get further along the process, you can't really do that as much um, by at least to get a handle of, of kind of where you want things to go and things like that. But I, I, I mean, it's, it's, it's a whole world, so why not play, play around? Um, and in regards to the second question, um, I, I get very skittish about people who fork GitHub repositories of unproven SDKs or unproven uh, whatever uh, and try to integrate into their app. And then once we deploy or after we deploy, that, uh, that, that's that code is not supported. Um, so I'm very, I get very, very nervous, nervous about that. Um, or I would rather encourage the developers I work with to build from scratch uh, as much as possible, um, just because 
but we know exactly what's going to happen um, once we get to production, as opposed to uh, building something that, say, is not going to be updated uh, within six months. Especially with mobile apps, because you know you're right. It's very much um, if something breaks or something, you know, you have that process you have to go through, especially with iOS, um, where you just don't have that uh, that downtime. Um, so I, I don't really encourage people uh, to put uh, that into production apps. Can I just quickly? I'm a little bit disagreeing, if that's okay. Okay, yeah, that's good. Yeah, so, because I mean, I I I kind of understand that there's there are some risks, but. I tend to use even big projects, you know, important clients. We, I tend to like to use what's out there, uh, and I know some of the stuff might not be, you know, as good quality as it necessarily is. But I mean, there's a ways to ways to go around that. We we run a test it. I take a component and we put it in. I'll I'll basically we do quite extensive testing anyways, so we kind of believe that if it breaks, then you know we will chuck it out and we'll notice before it breaks. And I mean, I kind of agree it's good to sometimes write from scratch and not use too many libraries, but you know, sometimes on the other hand, if it takes, if, it, if you can get something that'll take two days to build, you can get it in one hour and write a couple of tests. Well, I'm not saying like, to yeah. not use library yeah, yeah. at all. Um, I, I think you know if there's a framework or the library that has extensive documentation and extensive developer support, then go for it. And for me, it's just I've had projects get screwed because the developers form something on GitHub and screw the things up six months later. But it's easier. <laughs> Actually, to add to that, uh, we, we tend to focus on the things that are cutting edge but never bleeding edge. So whatever SDK that we use, we want to make sure that it's mature enough that there is a you know a strong community that's backed it up uh, or a company that's backed it up uh, before we go in there. Uh, because the last thing we want to do is uh, you know uh, play with something that is uh, not yet ready for prime time, and then your project gets stuck, and then you have to go you know pretty much replace the whole uh, rewrite the whole piece again to to get around that. Uh, agreed. Uh, definitely, always looking to make sure that things are being maintained. Uh, looking at the Git commit history and going, okay, how often is this thing actually working and being updated? But to answer an earlier question, like, um, like, how many like SDKs to include and stuff like that? Um, the answer really is um, there's so many uh, tools out there for like uh, the same kind of things, like local Linux and normal ownership, but they have push notifications systems. Um, there's and Google Analytics, Mixed Panel, um, Amateur slash Adobe, uh, Typecalis, whatever it's called now. Um, like the, all these systems have their own pricing models, their own uh, benefits, and you know, if you're if you're marketing, you have to get the best bang for your buck, right? So there is a benefit to putting in sometimes. Multiples just to try and A/B test your tools. Um, recently, a new kind of product came to my attention called Mparticle, uh, which uh, looks like an interesting platform because it kind of allows you to do that uh, in a better way. I haven't really tested it myself, but um, yeah, that that concept of just like making sure you're using the best tools for you and what your price point is, uh, you have to test things. So what I'm hearing is, in terms of say five, top five uh, SDKs for functionality, engagement, analytics, crash analytics, or something for you know test along the way. What are the who gets the fourth and fifth spot? What kind of functionality? Or is it just engagement and analytics? And is that literally what it comes down to? I mean, obviously, there's infrastructure to support your app and things of that sort. Um, but in terms of things that you have flexibility and multiple vendors to choose from, are those really the key topics that uh, some uh, CEO or a new developer has to make choices of? Uh, I mean, those are probably the two big ones. I mean, there's A-B testing as well, which kind of fits into its own category. Um, 
Why? What is it about the A-B testing SDK that's going to enable you to do that more effectively than just doing it on your own? Um, most of the A-B testing SDKs are geared towards giving you segmented data between your uh, tests and how they're using it uh, to really see which one's performing better. So it's, it's more geared towards that. So um, you're going to get that information in a cleaner way. Not to say you couldn't use more traditional analytic methods and build, and build out, you know, a AB <laughs> testing framework yourself. But you know, these tools are available. Might as well take advantage of them. Sure, kind of out of the box. Okay, so we're moving to kind of the third section. Before I do any questions down there from our uh, audience. Okay, you're just so awe inspired. That... Go ahead, young lady in the front. Yeah, so the question was who does the analysis for the teams with respect to UX specifically? Yes, well, you're talking a lot about using data analysis, um, which I know I'm not that familiar with. So yeah. I would like to know on some of you who are bigger and smaller teams, so do you have a research team or do you outsource that? Uh, we do everything kind of internally. We have very small teams, but our UX people, I think in this context, I think you mean with data analysis, like requirements and stuff like that. So our our UX people are kind of trained in a way, or, or are very good in a way, where they kind of they they talk to the actual users and they gather the requirements and they create the mockups using those discussions. If that answers your question, or well, when you're speaking of Google Analytics and some of the oh. other devices which you're using to analyze the product you've already oh, okay. doing that one, right? Oh, okay. Um, yeah, we have usually our team together with the client, but usually it changes at least for us. Um, we have a strategy team. Um, they kind of go through that. Um, so because they can take those learnings and you know, apply it to the product that we're working on. But since the strategy team also works with uh, every client we work with and kind of like um, helps our clients form their vision, uh, all that data helps them kind of learn from across different products how do people use the products. So that's the answer for that. Uh, we see that uh, the product manager is the, the person, uh, the product manager in the market, the uh, mobile marketing person. Is one is their role. Uh, since we're a pretty small team, uh, on the US side, we typically uh, what we do is we kind of educate and uh, enable our clients to be able to do this in their own. And then we, we guide them from a technology perspective to facilitate them uh, to, to, to do those data analysis. And yeah, actually, we have uh, <clears throat> we have like a handful of people who are very kind of savvy in, in Google Analytics and such. So. We have special needs on that where the client can do it, and we'll have like a special person that can come in and help. And uh, for us, uh, it, we we have fairly small teams, so it's usually the product lead, uh, a combination of us and the uh, and the product lead. Um, but most of our teams are also disciplinary too. So um, if the developer uh, has insights, then we can go in and kind of bring it into the room. Um, but it's, it's mainly the product that, that's responsible for that. Yeah, what I've seen is in big companies, they have analysts, they have teams of analysts that'll work on mobile, that'll work on web, that'll work on paid media. In smaller companies, it tends to be like, who's the guy who has the highest tolerance for working with spreadsheets and doing analytics, which is probably and sadly not the marketing guy. Um, but I think that's kind of one of the challenges, and I would say one of the shortcomings that I've seen in marketing in general is that there's not enough of that kind of analysis done. So there's still a lot of weighing in and not enough data-driven decisions. So great question. Go ahead. Uh, what are some of your goals to be testing apps, I guess, for desktop, and if there are some mobile ones you use right now? Um, I'm forgetting the one we have used in the Optimize it. Yes. Yeah. Optimize is the one we have used in the past. Uh, and they support both uh, mobile and web. Um, and there's another one 
but I can't quite remember at the moment. I personally haven't seen many on the mobile side. I think there are a ton, you know, on the email side, on the marketing automation side. Um, depending on what you're trying to optimize, landing pages, subject lines, you know, different rendering pages. Okay, so. I have a question. You get paid, you get that short question. Ah. This is called uh, the art and science of uh, personalizing mobile apps. I'm wondering. Do you guys have a use case of the art art side? Are there any kind of creative hooks that you've seen in an app that engage a user outside of the statistical kind of analytical side? Are there certain, you know, maybe personalizing with certain creative or certain, uh, you know, uh, functionality that you see is engaging users outside of the kind of realm of statistics and, and analytics? Uh, yeah, at least uh, we've done I mean, obviously, sometimes it's related to A-B testing that will try different designs at even different looks and feels that might be appealing to certain type of uh, clients. I, I, I haven't seen people doing like that much kind of personalized design stuff, but through A-B testing mainly. Uh, I don't know about Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I, I think it's kind of, it, it's still on that end. It, it's very much resource intensive uh, to, to kind of to think in that way. Um, so I haven't really worked on anything that's like really out the gate, you know, beautiful. Um, and I, I do think that when you talk about design and talk about personalized design, um, to be honest, I haven't seen anything that, that really has caught my eye. Um, there's different things now that um, some of the music apps are doing to kind of take what you do as far as like your your musical taste you know, and kind of create these musical landscapes like Apple Music is doing that right now. But uh, yeah, and, and as far as that goes, I think it's still kind of a wild west. Yeah, just to blow more on my own horn here, Clevertown, one of the reasons that we feel like we'll be able to get traction in the marketplace is because we allow people to do exactly that, personalize it. So if you're a male versus a female, the background will render differently. If you're a loyal customer versus a, an occasional customer, you'll get a different experience. So um, it's kind of to this young lady's question of like who's out there really pushing the envelope in, term, in terms of using data to provide a more personalized, customized experience. But you know, today there's not a lot out there, sadly. Um, kind of, we do have a data science team who does work on. They're they're just they're mainly using kind of uh, analytic stuff, but they might try to create sophisticated models. For instance, like. There might be a telco that you know has mobile clients, and then they'll do a model, an algorithm that'll try to forecast what what clients might be leaving, so they can provide them offers to keep kind of retention and stuff like that. But I haven't seen that on the design side though. What still blows me away is that you know the example, the very simple example that I gave. If you know. If you're an airline and you know that I like diet over regular, and you've got that data, and you know I'm going on a flight, why you can't leverage that to say, hey, Malcolm, do you want a Diet Coke on your flight? I mean, that would seem like a simple thing to, to kind of execute on. Why, you know, what's the barrier to that happening? Is it like nobody's looking at the whole experience? Is it, I mean, clearly it can't be a technological challenge. Uh, it kind of is. Um, so um, the thing is, because we have built the mobile app, I don't think you can still order a drink from the mobile app. But anyways, the point is to bridge that gap. But uh, airline building the like an in-flight entertainment system that kind of controls the stuff you watch and all that is is it's it's extremely hard to get proper software on it, right? So even running Node.js in an airplane. It's really hard, and I think that's part of the problem. It's very regulated. the The screens are regulated. The software that it runs is regulated. So, kind of putting that data together is kind of one of the biggest things that we've done for airlines in the in the near history. Yeah. Uh, 
And what about, uh, sort of to the same end, what about beacons? I mean, beacons would have seemed to have been like the promised land for marketers, right? I know where you are, I know where you're standing, I'm going to offer you 10 cents off, you know, tricks versus sugar smacks. Um, how come, those are deep, you know, like little kids. Um, how come those things haven't found their place in a more substantial and kind of regular way? Um, just from the clients we've kind of uh, talked to, um, um, one of our big clients, uh, Belt, down in uh, South Carolina, like one of their biggest obstacles is just the infrastructure. They have so many stores, uh, and the cost of putting this infrastructure in um, is, is high, so they have to make a really large investment, but they haven't. Like, that is the, the thing I see the most. You had another question. I had a dumb question. So we can find those too. Okay. So how are you typically recognizing these profiles? Do you do a lot of you just strictly desktop or because you said you're doing by gender, you're doing all these things you're segmenting? How do you just from a very practical of recognizing? Yeah, so for uh Clever Tab, one of the things that we do is we have a connection to Facebook. So if you integrate with Facebook, it's gonna pull in that data. But you can also integrate your point of sale system, or if you have a CRM. So that's kind of what I was driving at, at the earlier question about what's happening with the integration of the data. Again, one of the key themes I saw in marketing is people want a, a unified view of the customer. Even though mobile is different from web, from the customer, you know, if I'm flying on Alaska Airlines, I expect that they're gonna know me across platforms. So I still find it kind of surprising that there hasn't been this consolidation of data on the mobile side. You know, on the web, it's all you know, it's all baked with cookies and looking at your, you know, where you've been surfing and being able to pull a lot of data and then make email relevant or dynamically render a landing page to you. But I still haven't seen even the infrastructure part being done well on the mobile side. No, we do it internally. We have a you know part of our technology infrastructure is a database that we capture you know, all that information. So you can either integrate or you can use the API to pull in data and then just basically build a profile which will combine whatever the data that you pulled in plus whatever the clever tap data is there. So if you have in your app, whatever engagement you're recording, user events, whatever analytics. Um, we also do some integration with web, so there's a little bit of data coming in from that side. But you know, technologically, there's no reason why you couldn't have a fairly robust unified uh, user profile. The only reason is because you have to use our data to tools that actually do that specifically. Yeah, there are yeah, no, there are definitely vendors that you can take all your data and outsource it to, and then have them, um, you know, do that work for you again. It still happens to that more bigger, sophisticated, well resourced companies don't do that as frequently as you might expect. I lost my question. <laughs> um, all right, so we've kind of gone from you've got an idea, you've developed personas, you've kind of got a roadmap, then you go to this next phase where you built it, you've got your choice as the case. Uh, Cesar, you mentioned the idea of. Um, kind of key metrics or key performance indicators. Talk a little bit about the rest of you as well. What do you look for? You know, we know about you know monthly active users, day one, day three, day seven retention. Like, what are the things that you think about as you're helping somebody build and develop an app? Well, uh, like the daily active users and all that. Those are like just the baselines. But really, again, going back to uh, when you build up your personas, when you build up your user journeys, you want to see if your user journeys are actually working the way you expected them. You want to see if you, which parts of the app people aren't using and start asking questions like, why aren't you using them? Like it could be, let's check crash lyrics. Are, are your crashes happening in this section, the performance issues? It could be uh, the UX wasn't you know, really thought out well enough for this section, and that isn't why that's not why people aren't using it, or it could be, uh, you know, this this thing that you thought was 
kind of interesting, which is interesting. It wasn't really shouldn't have been part of your MVP product. Uh, you're building a new product from scratch. Um, yes, based on that, basically looking at heat maps, looking at uh, you know where the path of travel and where the last travel. Um, there is a, uh, a great tool on the web uh, called Hotjar that we use that actually records uh, each session come in. You can see how people are browsing through your site, where the mouse are, where they click on X. Pretty much a, a replay of uh, a user where uh, I have not found a similar solution to mobile, uh, which would, uh, you know, would be a great uh, feedback tool. I think for a lot of uh, apps that I work with, uh, the user onboarding is, is, is the number one problem. Um, they can get, say, 5,000 qualified leads, uh, 5,000, uh, say, 2,500 of those will demo the app in, you know, within one day. Uh, and then from there, um, maybe 500 continue. And that's just like a rough number. Um, so looking at exactly why uh, there's a drop off, um, it's been kind of the number one issue. Um, we talked about this earlier. It's like you have about 15 seconds to really wow somebody when you open up the app. Um, so trying to look and see exactly uh, within those 15 seconds what you're doing wrong. Um, are you presenting, presenting a login screen before uh, you're actually uh, telling the user what the app does? Uh, is your onboarding process very, very lengthy? Are you not, uh, say, having the user log into Facebook or creating extensive profiles, uh, things like that? Um, and just kind of pinpoint, pinpoint out those issues. Um, and then that's kind of like been like the, the biggest hiccup uh, for most of the app launches that I've worked with personally. Yeah, so um, I've uh, I kind of thought about this already before. <laughs> before this and um, it's kind of it's very difficult I mean we talk about kind of this retention and, and following up on the analytics somehow how you get more basically conversion and all that and I kind of think it's kind of not a separate <coughs> thing it kind of has to be built from day one and by day one I actually mean when you start designing the UX you should validate the UIs already then, you should try them out, even rough sketches. I mean, it's, it's yeah, analytics is definitely involved, but you shouldn't kind of forget that on the first day when, you, when you're building the UI, you should actually think about the flows on how, how the customer is gonna be able to purchase and, and as fast as they can and try them out with different people. And once you build it, from day one when you're writing code, follow the analytics, release early, then you, you'll have 20 people, 30 people, and you can already correct it much easier. So I mean, that's, I think this kind of, even though we're speaking it as a last stage in a way, I think it should be there from day one and throughout the whole process as well. I think that's a great point. Um, back to the original question though, are there any like, watershed metrics that you're going to pay attention to or think about or design to me as you're you know, launching that i mean ultimately you know it's a marathon not a sprint but um you know certain indicators or certain metrics give you an indication of how well things are going so anything specific joe um i think uh, what sources drive downloads is an uh, important metric uh, whether you are you know, just getting, uh, you know, some blog mentioned you, and then suddenly you see a, a spike in downloads, uh, or your uh, your ads on Facebook is uh, being very effective, and uh, or if you're doing multiple EV testing of different ads, which many of our clients do, uh, you know, they run different ads uh, with different images still, and they realize that uh, uh, the different images does give different results. Uh, what are people you're uh, targeting with those ads? Uh, I think those are great uh, metrics and being able to see, uh, being able to then filter through if you're mul running multiple campaigns at the same time, being able to see you know, which ones are uh, effective uh, and which ones are not so that you can then you know, uh, kind of place more resources on more effective uh, uh, techniques or approaches. So more of like the ad optimization, acquisition optimization type uh, yeah, so kind of a, uh, I would say, user acquisition A-B testing. Cool. We've got about two or three minutes, so I just want to make sure everybody wanted to ask a question. 
had a chance to ask a question. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm a new, uh, I'm trying to figure out, I guess, like what technology to actually take on. I'm a Ruby on Rails uh, full stack developer, but obviously not that popular right now. So I'm just thinking from an employable, <laughs> employable standpoint. Um, you guys mentioned React earlier, and you mentioned React Native. Uh, how does that fare, I guess, uh, in relation to, I guess, uh, Angular 2 is coming out. I'm trying to figure that out. Like, you know, should, no? Okay, great. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, and, uh, React uh, Native versus like uh, React uh, in Flux or React Firebase, like when you get Flux. Well, I'm a little bit more than guy, so you're looking at the wrong source for the main point. Yes, yeah, so I'm mobile. I, I... If you're planning to kind of, if you want to target multiple platforms, and I mean, React Native is bringing a whole new paradigm into the mobile software development. I, I do like that paradigm, uh, kind of close to functional programming in a way, um, which I really like. So I would look into that, but if you haven't done mobile, I mean, I don't know. It's it's what you want. If you want to do iOS specific stuff, then jump into Swift. If you want to do Android, go for Java. If you if you want to do a bit more and, and look into a new kind of go a bit more kind of bleeding edge, go React Native. I I, I reckon you won't be wrong if you do something. Uh, I actually really like Angular. Yeah. Uh, and <laughs> so that's cool. That's cool. <laughs> Um, yeah, I mean, it just, it's just kind of depends. Uh, you know, I, 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 I do think there's a demand for Ruby, though. I'm, I'm kind of curious about that, about your experience with that. Uh, but yeah, desktop Ruby, definitely. Um, yeah, Angular is it, it, great. I guess there's some security issues with it, um, but it's fast, it's, it's, it's lightweight. And yeah, it's just mobile, it just kind of depends on you know, pick your poison. Um, I was, um, is always going to be in demand because uh, all uh, iOS apps generate uh, the most revenue. Um, but there's always the uh, Android app development is not my favorite because there's a lot of. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's for, for for us, there's just there's so many device profiles in Android that it, 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 it's always an interesting time to do an Android app. Um, but yeah, they just have to pick your poison and see what you're comfortable with. Um, you know, if you like, you know, Swift is great. Um, if you're like C-based languages, you know, then Android development might do for you on your thing. Just, you know, just go out and experiment and see. Um, our web team tends to use uh, React at this point. Um, we're fully native, so we only use Swift or C for iOS or uh, Java. Um, kind of like React Native is an interesting platform, one that we're definitely keeping an eye on. But um, normally, with these any of these platforms that are uh, you know trying to promise like cross-platform development, you're you're traditionally going to be a release behind. Uh, so you're never really going to be on the cutting edge of, of Android or iOS, uh, in my experience so far. Um, so that's that's my only caveat to. Our, you know, if the thing we're trying to do, it's usually best to try and if you're sticking with mobile, you want to have the latest technologies available on, on either iOS and Android a bit at your disposal, especially on iOS. Uh, Android, because of uh, barriers and compatibility issues, you can sometimes get away with it and probably, you know, something like React Native could be uh, an okay solution, but for iOS, I would definitely say you want to be on Swift. Um, so from a startup perspective, since we're looking for any startups, uh, the early stage startups, uh, the trend we've seen in the past, uh, people always talk about iOS and Android, uh, but then after they've done an iOS app, they pretty much don't have much, much budget for Android. Uh, but what you're seeing uh, this year is a big shift uh, actually Android, uh, the demand for Android has picked up dramatically uh, from, from our advantage, uh, uh, almost to a point that we were caught by, uh, we caught off guard. So we, We've, uh, we trained a lot of our Android developers on iOS uh, two years ago because we saw that the demand for Android just wasn't there. Uh, and then suddenly it just picked up, uh, and now we are cross-training people back to Android. 
It's actually funny because since I mean we work a lot in Europe as well, and Android is much like bigger there. I mean here in the U.S., everybody's always like iOS. You don't give up. You don't, you don't care about Android, but I mean depends where you want to target. If you want to target U.S., I'd probably go for iOS. Any uh, last pearls of wisdom as we close the panel to our uh, audience? Thank you all for coming. Yeah, build stuff yeah. as much as you can. Uh, yeah, just, just to, you know, just play around with stuff. Uh, do as many hackathons as you can. Um, you know, I'm working now with some internet thing stuff, and then you know the. the Five dollar raspberry guys trying to get my hand on one of those. So um, just, just the world, the world is out there, man. So just, just build it. Uh, yeah, build, test, repeat, and uh, use anything up there that's at your disposal to make this any to cut that time as short as possible. Don't overbuild from day one, which is usually a big mistake that you start with. So I just wanted to thank everyone for coming to this event, our inaugural New York um, panel and New York kind of event series. Thank you guys. Drinks at the back, and hope you guys stay a little, stick around for a little bit, and we can now uh, meet each other and network a little bit. Thank you again. Have a good night.